Well, let's get into God's word. Would you join with me and let's just go before the Lord and let's ask the Holy Spirit to speak to us through his word today. Let's just join together in prayer one more time. Father, we thank you for the opportunity that we have to come into this place, not to fulfill religious tradition, but Lord, to hear from you through your word. So God, I pray that it's not my precepts, it's not just my thoughts, but Lord, I pray that it's your word that as we look into that, that speaks into our lives. Lord, it's your Holy Spirit that, that backs what we look at, and Lord, that speaks right into where we're at. And so Lord, I pray as we walk out of this place, the very purpose for which we're here tonight, Lord, is to worship and to exalt and to glorify you, but rather also to be equipped and edified by your word that we might walk out of this building to look and reflect you, look more like you and reflect you for all that we do and all that we do in our lives. In Jesus' mighty name, we all together said... Amen. If you got your Bibles, go to John chapter 14. John chapter 14. As I want to talk about a subject that was on my heart, I believe that the Lord impressed it upon my heart a couple of uh, days ago, really, when I knew that I was going to be talking about what we wanted to talk about. And uh, John chapter 14, Jesus is, is, is one of his final discourses with his disciples before he goes to the cross, and right before he has the supper or the last supper. He gives them a couple of different statements and does a great couple of things. He washes their feet as an example of service to, uh, servitude to them, as well as he says some things. And Jesus says these words in John chapter 14, and really what I want to focus in and, and hone in on today is this, this scripture, and this is what we're going to really focus in on today. In John chapter 14, verse number 27, Jesus says, Peace I leave with you. My peace, he says, I give to you. Not as the world gives to you, do I give to you. So let not your heart be troubled, neither let it be afraid. The subject of peace, the subject of the peace of Jesus. You know, one of the things that I find in life is that life is full of seasons. I was just reading through the book of Ecclesiastes just this last week in my study time. And it's amazing just how Solomon and his insight, you know, kind of on one side you've got the Proverbs and on the other side you've got the Ecclesiastes and you kind of wonder what is going on. You've got like the, the, the ultimate wisdom and then all wisdom is vanity and all these different things. But the essence of what he's saying is that life, life is a series of events and many of which we cannot control, which we don't have control over. And one of the things that I've realized in the course of my short, my, my short stint on this earth is that life is full of unexpecteds, of seasons, of seasons of ups and seasons of downs, of seasons of ins and seasons of outs, uh, of seasons of sunshine and seasons of storm. As a matter of fact, even as I was preparing to, to speak this message and, and to, to bring what I believe God had impressed upon my heart, for a while, as I was thinking about this journey that we're going to take tonight in God's Word, just this morning, somebody very near and dear to my heart, somebody very special to me and, and my wife, they experienced one of the greatest tragedies that they can experience in life, uh, the passing of one of their children. And as I was thinking about it, it's just amazing how, how sometimes life comes at us so hard and life comes at us so unexpectedly that there are storms that we find in life. And as Jesus tells his disciples, and this is really kind of his last words to his disciples, before he goes to the cross, he says these words, he says, peace I give to you. Not just peace I give to you, but then he says these words, he says, my peace I give to you. You see, we've done studies of the word peace, and we've talked about the subject of peace. Uh, I think when I went back on the sermons, uh, when Pastor Dan was doing his series on upwards, the first time I started thinking about this message was when Pastor Dan was doing his series. As a matter of fact, I was going to preach this message, or the, there's the idea of this, and that night he was going to do it, and I said, I don't want to coincide, and I'm going to give you the, the leeway, but it was back in January when we talked about the series of upwards, and Peace being the fruit of the Spirit or the evidence of God's Spirit on the inside of us is something that we naturally live in peace. But specifically today, and when I look at the words of Jesus, one of the things that I've been dealing with in my own life is the, is the, the essence of taking Jesus' words literally, not just at face value. So there are things that, that, that God has been working in my heart on, things that I've read that Jesus says that I, I've realized in my own life that I've taken them more as suggestion than literal. And we do this a lot of times in church because of, uh, of the simplicity of what Jesus says. And as I was looking at these words, Jesus specifically says to his followers, peace I give to you. And he doesn't just say peace, but rather he says specifically my peace. And I thought to myself, what is the peace of Jesus? When I look at the peace that Jesus says, I don't just give you peace, I give you my peace. What is the peace that Jesus Christ gives to each and every one of us? And as I was looking and as I was studying, I saw, I saw some, amazing, some amazing insights to the word of God. And I realized that 
In this thing that we call life, in this unexpected and oftentimes, at, at times it feels random events or series of events that we call life, we have seasons of storms. Storms that surround us, but also storms within us. Storms of things that go on around us, but also storms of emotions and of things that, that happen on the inside. And as I was looking at this subject or the context of the peace of Jesus and what is it, I was reading and I was studying this, this story that we find in the Synoptic Gospels. The Synoptic Gospels are Matthew, Mark, and Luke, which means that they all tell kind of the same story in the same order. They all work in synergy together. Now, John, John kind of writes in a different way, kind of presents it in a different than Robert Maud do for the guys that were here on Friday. He said it like this, like John is like for the ones that like the notebook and the love story. John is the one for that. But Matthew, Mark, and Luke, they wanted to get the facts down. And so they're called the Synoptic Gospels. And in all three of these Gospels, this story is there. But it's interesting is that all three of them kind of give it in a different light. And today I want to focus on a particular story, speaking specifically to what the peace of Jesus Christ is in our lives that he gives to us. And we find this story in Mark, the fourth chapter. So if you've got your Bibles... Turn with me to Mark chapter 4 as we look at this interesting and unique story. You see, Matthew tells about this story and, and Luke also tells about this story. Both of them found, I believe, in the 8th chapter. But Mark in the 4th chapter tells this story with a very unique perspective. And I'll point that out in just a moment. But in Mark, the 4th chapter, we see some things. And as we look at the subject of these storms, of these tempests that come about us and also dwell within us, we realize that Jesus gives us his peace to deal with the storms of life. That Jesus gives to us his peace that we might deal or that we, have, we might be able to bear or carry or endure through the storms of life. But there was an interesting story here in Mark, the fourth chapter. In Mark, the fourth chapter, there's a story of the wind and the waves obey Jesus is the subject or the, ta the title of that. Verse number 35, it says, on the same day Jesus was ministering to some people, Jesus says, uh, let us cross over to the other side. And I don't think I have that on the overhead, but that's okay. And he goes on and he says, when they left the multitude, they took him along in the boat as he was. And other little boats were also with him. And this is where we get into it. And a great windstorm arose. Now we're talking about the Sea of Galilee. I've been to Israel twice now, and both times I was on the Sea of Galilee. The Sea of Galilee struck me as something very contrary to what we read here. It's very tranquil, very, very uh, glass-like. Almost all day long, there's this very subtleties about this. And I remember when I was in Israel, and I was asking our guide as we actually went out on a boat and sang oceans. If you if you know anything about you know like church stuff, we went out on the boat. And actually, it was the boat that Hillsong United recorded the song "Oceans" on for the Israel tour. And, we all sang oceans together and we gave a little thing about, you know, the wind and the waves and all these different things. But what's so weird about it is that the Sea of Galilee was glass-like. There's even this haze that settles on it because it's slightly below sea level. And so all of the air comes and kind of pushes down on the sea and it creates this real glass-like experience on the ocean. And I remember when I was there, I was asking my tour guide that was there. I said, I'm, I'm confused. I don't quite understand because I read in the New Testament that storms would come up on this lake. And, and when you say, when you read things like in, in the book of Mark, Jesus says to his disciples, let us go to the other side. I think sometimes we picture, if you've never been there or never seen it, we picture these great vast bodies of water. But the Sea of Galilee is truly not that big. So when Jesus says, let us go to the other side, he's actually physically just pointing to the other side of the lake, saying, let's go over there, guys. It's, it's that simple. It's not that big of a body of water. I would relate it probably equivalent to about the Salton Sea, somewhere in that size, maybe a little bit smaller than that. So as Jesus points to his disciples, it's a short day's journey. He says, let's go over there, literally to there. And so he points over there, and the Bible tells us, and Mark tells us, Matthew tells us, and Luke also tells us, that as they were out there in this boat, that a tempest or a storm began to arise. And I was asking the guide, I don't understand. How do storms come up? And he said, every once in a while, through certain seasons of the year, 
The wind patterns change. Normally the winds blow from the Mediterranean towards the inland. So from the, uh, the west to the east, the onshore breeze kind of blows through and that kind of keeps it. But he says every once in a while, the hot air of the desert on the Middle East creates these massive windstorms that blow from east to west. And as the winds come over the mountains, they sink into the valley of the lake. And he says all of a sudden, he says, you wouldn't believe the storms on the sea because of the great winds that arrive or that come from the great sandstorms of the Middle Eastern deserts in places like Damascus and Syria and Iran and Iraq. The winds are pushed all the way into Israel. And so he's talking about these great scenes, uh, these great storms and how a great many of boats even today sink on the Sea of Galilee because of these surprise windstorms that show up. And so he was talking about this. And so this is exactly what happens as a great storm shows up. And it says, uh, it goes on and it says, though, there was a windstorm arose and the waves beat into the boat so that it was already filling with water. So that's not a good thing. If you've ever been in a boat before, you know that boats should not have water in them. Why? Because they're supposed to be in water. So water in a boat means that the boat is sinking. There shouldn't be that. So water's filling in the boat. So the boat is beginning to sink. It's beginning to lose its buoyancy. And the disciples, those who are in the boat, are having a problem. And it tells us in verse number 38, it says that he, Jesus, was in the stern asleep on a pillow. Now think about that for a moment. Jesus is in the middle of this storm on a small boat. This isn't a big, you know, galleon. This isn't, you know, the big ships that sailed across the great Atlantic in the era of exploration. We're talking about fishing boats. As a matter of fact, there's a boat on display that they found in the mud in the Sea of Galilee that's around the time of Jesus. They actually, they titled it the Jesus Boat because it'll sell more tickets to see the Jesus Boat than rather just like the old boat. But it's, it's a Jesus Boat. It's about 20 feet long. So they would pile into these boats and they would use them for fishing and they would sail across the other side or when it was tranquil, they would row across to the other side. And in this small boat, Jesus is in the back of this boat asleep, perched upon a pillow. Now, I remember, I think back to like the 1970s, they had this Jesus movie where they kind of told through the story of Jesus and they narrated the story of Jesus. And there's this, this imagery of Jesus on this boat sleeping. I think it's kind of funny because as I was watching it, like they, they, they got this picture of Jesus on this little boat and the waves are crashing on Jesus and he's still asleep. So you kind of wonder like, wait a minute, how is he sleeping when water is splashing all over? I mean, if the boat that he is in is filling with water and Jesus is on a pillow sleeping, you kind of wonder what's going on. But then look what happens. It says it like this. It says, uh, they, they said to, to Jesus as he was asleep and they woke him up and they said, teacher, don't you care? That we're going to die. That we're perishing. Don't you care? Jesus says these words. He, he, arrayed, he woke, or excuse me, he arose. And he rebuked the wind. And he says to the sea, peace, be still. And the wind ceased. And there was a great calm. And it's an amazing story. We've talked so much about the peace of Jesus being perched upon the pillow during the middle of a storm. When everybody was uh, concerned about perishing. But what really stood out to me as we look about what is this piece of Jesus that Jesus says, I give to you as a gift and I don't give it like the world gives, but I give it to you. What is this piece of Jesus? And what was interesting about what I found in Mark's account is that Matthew doesn't say what Jesus says. And Luke doesn't say what Jesus says. Only Mark, as he's recounting what Peter is telling him, and, and, and Peter's firsthand example is Mark says, Jesus got up in the middle of the storm and he spoke to the storm, peace, be still. You see, what's amazing about that is that the Bible tells us from Genesis all the way through Revelation that the way in which God works is God speaks. You see, God spoke creation into existence. God spoke and solar systems came. God spoke and the earth was formed. God spoke and the planet or the, the, the sea and the, 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 the land were separated. God spoke and the birds of the air and the, the beasts on the land were there. God spoke. And what, what John tells us as he elaborates on this is that Jesus Christ is the spoken word of God that has come and was made as humanity. So imagine that the word of God is speaking the words of God. And Jesus speaks the word of God as he is the word of God to the storm, to the wind and the waves. And he speaks literally to the storm and he says, peace. And the storm subsides. 
You know, sometimes I think we, we, we focus a lot about Jesus resting on that pillow. And I think as a parent, I do this oftentimes in my, with my own kids. Sometimes we'll get up or we'll be napping and I kind of want to test them. I want to see how they respond to, to dad when dad doesn't wake up. What do they do? And so they come and they shake me and I'll start snoring and pretending. and They'll shake me a little bit more and I'll, I'll roll over or they'll shake me. and Dad can't wake up. Dad, wake up. Dad, wake up. Dad, wake up. And I'll just kind of just pretend to play. I almost sometimes wonder if Jesus was back there on the boat, just kind of looking at them with one eye waiting to see how long they would go until they needed him. Because you see, the amazing thing I see is that the peace that Jesus gives us is the very word of peace that Jesus speaks to the storms of life. And that the peace of Jesus can calm the very storms of the sea. That the words of Jesus, that the spoken peace of Jesus gives us the ability to bear and to endure and to continue through those storms that come about us as well as the storms that rise up within us in our lives. And Jesus, as he speaks to this storm, all of a sudden it freaks the disciples out because they've seen people be healed. They've seen food uh, miraculously appear, but nobody and in anybody's lifetime has seen somebody speak to wind and waves to make them stop at the very command of a voice. But the peace of Jesus has the power to calm the storms. And this is the very peace that Jesus gives to us. And I thought, how interesting is it that Jesus speaks this peace into the storms of life when we find and we realize that there are storms that you and I will endure. And I don't just speak of physical storms outside, raining and lightning and thunder. I speak of, of storms, of things that happen around us of events that are far beyond our control that we cry out and we ask God, why is this happening to me today? Storms that arise within us as we struggle and as we wrestle and as we question, as we work through this thing that we call salvation in our lives, as, as these tempests rise up of doubt or understanding or, or, or confusion. God, why is this happening to me today? And now the peace of Jesus Christ is, is able to speak to the storm that we might continue in that. But you know, I found what was interesting as we continue in on this journey of what is this peace of Jesus that audibly, vocally speaks to the storm as there's yet one more account in the Gospels, the synoptics, Matthew, Mark, and Luke, both all talk about them. A one more account of Jesus on yet another storm on the Sea of Galilee. Matthew talks about it in the 18th chapter. Uh, uh, Luke also as well. Uh, Mark does as well, and I, or excuse me, the 14th chapter. And I want to take you to Matthew's perspective because once again, Matthew gives us an interesting perspective, something unique to the other gospels. So go with me to Matthew, the 14th chapter. You see, as we turn to Matthew chapter 14, we realize that his peace is able to calm storms around us and also to calm the storms within us. But there's an interesting subject. That happens here in Matthew, the 14th chapter. They've just uh, seen miracles. Jesus has multiplied food once again, and Jesus once again tells his disciples, hey guys, let's go over there. Same lake, same body of water, different time. Time has progressed. This is now again later on in the story as they're written chronologically in the Gospels. And it tells us in Matthew, the 14th chapter, Immediately, our, verse number 22, immediately Jesus made his disciples get into the boat and go before him to the other side. And he sent the multitudes away. This won't be up on the screen. I'm just giving you some background. And when he sent the multitudes away, he went up on the mountain himself to pray. And the evening came and he was alone. But the boat there was in the middle of the sea. Listen to this once again. Tossed by the waves. For the wind was contrary. Now in the fourth watch of the night, late in the morning... Jesus went to them walking on the sea. And when the disciples saw him walking on the sea, they were troubled, saying, It's a ghost! They cried out for fear. But immediately Jesus spoke to them and says, Be of good cheer, for it is I. And Peter answered and said, Lord, if it is you, command me to come out onto the water. And Jesus responds to Peter, come. So Peter had come down out of the boat. He walked on the water to go to Jesus. But when he saw that the wind was boisterous, he was afraid. 
And beginning to sink, he cried out saying, Lord, save me. And immediately Jesus stretched out his hand and caught him and said to him, Oh, you of little faith, why did you doubt? And when they got into the boat, the wind ceased. And as I was thinking, as we're talking about this gift of peace that Jesus gives to us, this peace that Jesus embodied, this peace that Jesus had, this peace that was Jesus, the very peace that Jesus was the Word of God, who spoke the Word of God, who spoke peace, and the winds and the waves ceased to exist. Now all of a sudden we find ourselves later chronologically in time, and there Peter sees Jesus out in the water, and Jesus, Peter says to Jesus, if it's you, bid me to come out to you, and I'll walk on the water to you. What a crazy idea. And Jesus says, come. And we know the story because this is the, 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 the centrality of faith. This is the message. This is the story. The, the prime example of a life of faith is Peter getting out of the boat, stepping out of his comfort zone in, into a place. And, you know, the message of faith is that, you know, he looked to the side, he looked to the left, and he looked to the right, and he didn't fix his eyes on Jesus. But the interesting thing I see and the uniqueness of Matthew's account of this is Peter's walking on the water. You see, Mark doesn't talk about it, nor does Luke. But Matthew talks about Peter's walking out on the water, stepping out. And the interesting thing that I find is that Jesus did not calm the storm when Peter went out on the water. You see, the first time they were in the boat together, Jesus calmed the storm. The second time they were in the boat, Jesus called Peter out in the midst of a storm. And it wasn't until after Peter sank that they got back to the boat that Jesus once again calmed the storm. And so when I look at this idea of what is the peace of Jesus, I think to myself, what is he doing by this? You know, Jesus was smart. Jesus was a blue collar guy, grew up in Nazareth, didn't have much of an education by the world's standards. But, you know, I'd venture to say in my own personal belief that I think Jesus was probably the smartest person who ever existed on the face of the earth. I mean, think about it like this. If Jesus is the word of God who was made flesh and dwelt among us, that Jesus was the embodiment of the words of God that spoke creation. The one who put solar systems into place and set the minutest of ecosystems into place at the same time. You see, Jesus understood the molecular structure of humanity before humanity even knew what molecules were. He could look at the molecular structure of leprosy and say, let me reverse that spiritually for you to create it to what it was. Jesus was a genius. Jesus could understand the thoughts of the people around him before they even knew what they were thinking. And I think that Jesus knew that Peter was going to sink before Peter ever knew he was going to sink. So Jesus did not on purpose calm the storm for Peter. Why? To teach us the lesson that the peace of God may not always calm the storms around us, but it can always calm the storms within us. You know, I think so often as humanity, just by nature, by the, by the very fact of the way we exist, whenever we find ourselves in storms and in trials and in hardships, what do we say? God, get me out of this. Stop this. I can't handle this. This storm is too much for me. But yet what I see is Jesus telling his disciples, I showed you that I've got peace enough to calm the storms. Now I want you to walk out in the middle of the storm and focus not on what's going on from the side to side, but rather look at the producer of the peace. Look at the provider of peace. Look at the provision from where peace comes. Keep your eyes fixated on his name, which is the Prince of Peace. Why? Because he does not always calm the storms that happen around us, but his, his peace can and will always calm the storms from within us. You see, Jesus knew that Peter was going to have to walk in the middle of a storm, but if Peter would have kept his eyes fixated on the producer of the peace that had Peter could have lived on and walked on, that Peter would have walked as though on solid ground in the midst of a tempest around him. 
And you see, Jesus tells his disciples, you will have hardships. Tribulations will come. I didn't come just so that you wouldn't have any trials and any hardships, but rather I would come that, that, that you would live a life like me. And he tells them, but be of good cheer because I've given you the greatest gift humanity could ever have. I've given you my peace. You see, his peace is our peace. The very peace that, that carried the cross and calmed the storms exists in you and in I today. And Jesus knew exactly like Peter that you and I would endure storms that, and that, that, that proceed around us. And sometimes the peace of God can calm the storms about us. But sometimes God says, I want you to walk through the storm so that you would keep your eyes fixated and focused upon the producer and the source and the power of peace. And that is Jesus Christ. Why? Because Jesus didn't just say, I give you peace. Jesus said, I give you my peace. That when we would focus on him, that when we would keep our eyes fixated upon him, that when everything is going wrong around us and within us, that we would look to God and say, I don't understand. That we would say, you know what? I'm okay. So people like Paul the Apostle can write that I, I'm perplexed, but I'm not downcast. I'm, I'm confused and I don't understand, but I'm not in despair. That I'm hard pressed on every side, but I'm not crushed. Why? Because I might see the waves on each side of me, but I don't focus on the storm around me. But I focus on the source of peace in front of me. And that is Jesus Christ, so that I might walk on the wind and the waves. And that I might exist and endure this season of life and this storm in my life. That I might come out on the other side, a shining beacon of light to those who are around me. And that I wouldn't live my life of anxiety, not understanding and not knowing how to endure these hardships and these storms that arise from within, but rather that I would look to Jesus. You see, Paul the Apostle encourage, encourages us, the church, in Philippians. Paul says, listen, don't be anxious. Anxiety will rob us of our peace, of, of our hope. He says, don't be anxious, but in everything, through prayer and supplication, with thanksgiving, let your requests be made known to God. Why? That the peace of God that surpasses all understanding, listen to this, would guard your heart and your mind. You know, I think about it like this. I, I, I remember the first time I took it, I was in college, but there's all these different personality profile tests. I really enjoy them. I, I love the science of, of psychology. And I remember the first time I took a personality profile, I found out a little bit more about myself. And when I read it, I thought, man, how do they know me so well? If you've ever heard of the Myers-Briggs or personality profiles, I am an INTP, which means that I am a logician, which means I think all, I'm all head. Uh, if it doesn't work out in my head, it doesn't work out. Now, what was interesting is I remember remember when I took this, the, the, the last part of the personality profile test that they give you in these psychological categories is two categories. It's an A or a T. It's assertive or, or, or um, turbulent. It doesn't sound very good. Assertive is a type of person that when they make decisions in life, they say, man, I, I made the best decision. The decision that I make is, is the, only, the only right decision. The turbulent personality is the person who constantly second guesses themselves. They call them perfectionists. And I remember when I took the psychological profile test, it gives you the percentage of how far on one side of the scale you are to, to one or the other. So are you an assertive person or are you a turbulent person? Generally, you'd want to be somewhere in the middle so that way you know you've got some sense of quality control in your life, and, and, but you've also got some sense of confidence. I was 90% Turbulent. <laughs> Perfectionist, second-guessing myself, don't want to make the decisions because it's always the first decision I make is always the, the wrong decision. As a matter of fact, my wife and I were both the same way in that. So we ever say, we say whenever we got a big decision, we say, you know what, what do you want to do? And she's like this. And I'm like, what do you want to do? And she's like, like we're like this. And it's like, okay, what's plan B? Because plan A, you know it's going to be wrong. Just pick plan B. <laughs> and somebody with my personality traits, who's very heady and very perfectionist and turbulent when it comes to decision making, has a hard time living and operating in peace. Because for me, and I'm just telling you me, for me, 
Uh, my motivation generally is backed upon the successes of the things that I endeavor in. So if I reach out and try something and it's not successful, if I don't see motivational gains, if I don't see things going the way that happens, I don't count myself to be a successful person. Those are the weaknesses of that profile, that personality tra trait that I have. And on top of that, to be a turbulent type person, it's a hard time for me to, to stand in the peace of making a decision. But you know what? Thank God that I don't live my life just based upon what a personality profile tells me. Because it, the profiles might tell me that I'm a turbulent personality, but I've got something unique to the world. I've got a gift in my life. And that's what Paul the Apostle says, that I don't have to be anxious, even though oftentimes with my decisions, I'm anxious. I don't have to be anxious. Why? Because the peace of God that surpasses. Remember how I said I was a logician? Check this out. The peace of God that surpasses all logical understanding would guard your heart and your mind. You see, it's inexplicable. It, it, it's, it's unexplainable. It, we, it's uncomprehendable. It's illogical. And that is the peace that Jesus Christ gives to you and to me that we would live and that we would operate in it so that when somebody looks at you in the storms of your life and you're walking on the water in the middle of the storm they say I don't get how you can handle it so well and you say I don't even understand it myself but I got something and it's the gift of God it's not peace like hey take a big deep breath kind of peace it's not like take a moment and clear your mind kind of peace this is the peace of the creator of the universe. This is the peace of the word that was made flesh. This is the peace of God who spoke to the storms of life and watched them calm. And now he says, that peace, that's the peace I give to you. Now you and I have it through the Holy Spirit that we might carry it through the course of our lives. And I love what Paul the Apostle tells in the midst of his own storm. If you ever want to read about hardships, Read 2 Corinthians. Paul's talking about all sorts of different things. He talks about the very fact that he despaired his life and wanted to die. For me, I'm one of those kind of like glasses. I, although I naturally respond glasses half full. I'm naturally one of those glasses half empty type persons. But I remember randomly somebody asked me, what is the glass? And I was like, half full. And I was like, yes! <laughs> but for me, that's always something that's so intrigued me. Why? Because life has its ups and its downs. So often I think that the Christian mindset is, is that we always got to be bubbly and happy and on top of it and we got to show everything. But Paul the Apostle says, look, man, I, my, life was, my life was so bad that I just wanted to die. But I love what Paul the Apostle says, and it's, it's a prayer. Whenever somebody asks me, Pastor Luke, this is what I'm going through, I said, this is a prayer that you should pray over yourself in 2 Corinthians, the first chapter, verse number 3. Paul writes it out for you and I that we can pray. He says, I thank God, the Father of all mercies and the Lord of Jesus Christ, that our God is merciful and he is the source of all comfort. I love what he says. Look at what he says. He comforts us in all our troubles so that we could comfort others when they are troubled. We will be able to give them the same comfort that God has given us. You see, God's peace, the very peace that Jesus spoke to the storms that made them stop, exists through the Holy Spirit on the inside of you and on the inside of me when we follow Jesus Christ. And Jesus says, and God says this, and Paul the Apostle understood this, and he says, not only do you have peace, but you have peace to the point that you would walk through the course of a storm and you would come out better on the other side so that you could give what you received in the middle of the storm to somebody who's walking through the storm again in your life. You could see somebody going through what you were going through and you can say, hey, I made it through. You can make it through. And it's not because you can do it, not because of your tenacity, not because of your ability to pursue, but rather it's because you can have the peace that speaks to the storms on the inside of your life to make it through through the power of the Holy Spirit. To, to be a bright beacon of light to the world. I mean, you think about the progression of the power of Jesus Christ that spoke peace into the storms of life. The very first time we saw Jesus speaking into a storm, he spoke into a physical storm. 
The second time we see Jesus, he let Peter walk through the storm. The third time now we see is in the exemplification of the apostles and the disciples after Jesus has gone. And now a great proverbial storm called persecution has arised in the church. And in the beginning, the disciples and the apostles, they hid in the upper rooms of Jerusalem for fear of everybody around them and the persecution. But then all of a sudden, they received the gift that Jesus was talking about, the power of the Holy Spirit. And the peace of God came about them, and they left the blocked doors of the upper room, and they went out into the streets. And in Acts in the ninth chapter, in the midst of the deepest persecution that the early church saw at the behest of a man by the name of Saul, it says it like this in Acts the 31st and Acts 9th chapter, verse number 31, it says, the churches, in one of the hardest seasons of persecution that they had, throughout Judea, Galilee, and Samaria, the region, had peace and were edified. And walking in the fear of the Lord and in the comfort of the Holy Spirit, they were multiplied. You see, this is the exemplification of the peace of God at work on the inside of us. That when these men and these women were running for their lives, the very reason that they were leaving Jerusalem was to escape the persecution of men like Saul who were hunting them down and dragging them out of their homes and locking them up in prison. That the very reason that they were on the run for their lives, yet in the middle of their running, in the middle of the storm of their life, that God did not calm the storm of persecution around them. God calmed the storms on the inside of them. And everywhere they went, they preached about the peace of Jesus Christ. And they were edified and they multiplied. Why? Because even in the midst of the storm, God wants to see growth in his body. And so Jesus calms the storm. And then he invites Peter to walk in the storm. And then he puts his disciples in the middle of a storm that he does not calm so that they would now learn to walk through it and come out better on the other side. See, for those of you that are in this place today, and you're on a storm, that you've got things going on in your life, you've got things going around, you, that you don't have any control on. You feel like you're in a tailspin. Take solace in understanding that God has a special place for you in his heart. As a matter of fact, the Bible tells us in Psalms, the 34th chapter, I think it's verse number 18, that, that the Lord's heart is near those who are brokenhearted. And that like the disciples who were going through the storms of life and come out on the other side, you and I could live a life like Psalms, the 46th chapter, verse number 10 says, Be still and know that I am God. It may not make sense. You may not get the answers to the questions that you're asking. You may not understand why or what is happening. The peace of God may not calm the storms around you. But if you would fix your eyes on the provision, if you would fix your eyes on the power of, if you would fix your eyes on the Prince of Peace, Jesus Christ. You can walk through the storm with the very power of peace that Jesus used to speak calm into the storms of life. And you can know that the storms that rage on the inside of you, you can have peace in. Why? Because Jesus says, my peace, not just peace. My peace, not just take a big deep breath, peace. My peace, not just, well, it'll all work out in the end, peace. No, Jesus says, my peace, the peace that spoke to the storms, peace, I give to you. And I love it. He says, and I don't give it like the world gives it. You see, the world likes to just say, well, peace to you. Peace to you. I hope everything works out. Jesus says, no, it's not a wishful thought. It's a promise that you can go to the bank on. It's a guarantee That if you have Jesus, you have the Holy Spirit. If you have the Holy Spirit, you have the Comforter. And if you have the Comforter, you have the one that gives you comfort in all of your trials so that you can live in the peace of God that surpasses all logical understanding. You see that word in Philippians, the fourth chapter, verse number seven, guard is a military term like a prison guard who stops that which comes in and determines that which goes out. Now the peace of God acts as a guard to your heart to say, I will watch what I allow into my heart and I will watch what I allow to come 
come out of my life. Why? Because I'm not going to look to the left and I'm not going to look to the right. I'm going to stand on the Word of God even if I don't understand it, even if it doesn't make any sense to me, and I'm going to fix my eyes on Jesus Christ, the author and finisher of my faith, who exemplified the very peace of God to walk himself to the hill of Calvary for the joy set before him, endured the cross, despising shame. That's the peace that Jesus gives to you and that he gives to me in the storms of our life. So today, if you find turmoil in your life, if you find yourself in a turbulent situation, my encouragement to you is to fix your eyes on the provider of the peace, Jesus Christ. Because as you lock your eyes on him, you will walk through that storm of life like 2 Corinthians, the first chapter, verse number 3 and 4 says, and that you will come out on the other side an example for others to see, that you could pass off what God has given to you as an example of what God has. Today, Jesus says, peace I give to you. My peace I give to you. And I pray as we walk out of this place, whatever it might be, whether you're in a season when the sun is shining in your life or you're in a season when all hell is breaking loose, that you and I would fix our eyes and fix our gaze upon Jesus, to recognize that it's through him we'll make it through this storm. And that you'll make it. You'll make it. You will make it through this storm.